This year, the Hopewell Valley School District took a giant step in the area of technology. It's the first step in a multi-year plan that will significantly increase technology resources in our schools and enhance the teaching learning process in each of our schools. What we did this year was to replace the older equipment in the computer labs in the elementary school with new equipment and we added another lab at Bear Tavern which is the largest elementary school in the district. At Timberlane we opened up a new computer lab and in the high school we upgraded one lab and formed two other new computer labs. More importantly, we recognize the fact that our teachers need training in technology if they're going to be comfortable using it in their instructional program. And we began a series of staff development activities for our teachers. It is imperative that schools bridge relationships with, with parents and, and the local community. In Hope Hopewell Valley, we've done that in many cases, many instances over the past few years. This case in, in Hopewell uh, Elementary School being just one. Um, it's great when we have uh, experts in the field and who are willing to dedicate time and volunteer their time to come into our schools to, to help us out with, with various school projects. It's great when we have a resource such as a, a Jim Arbiter who can come into our schools and really enhance the, the instruction with technology and work with our computer teachers to really bring about a, a realistic and uh, meaningful uh, activity and projects that the kids will remember for a long time to come. The reason I wanted to do this project was really for fun. I had been in one of Fran McGuire's creative writing workshops uh, in her third grade class and had seen how excited the children were in writing their stories and I thought that their stories were so close to something that could be almost made into a, a little film that I thought boy what a great opportunity to bring the computer into the classroom and allow these children to try different kinds of expressions with their work. Uh, they would now have available to them not only writing but sound, uh, animations, they could bring pictures onto the screen they could try uh, moving video. So I thought this could be a great thing. So I talked to Fran about it, and she was excited. Although I had been using a computer regularly for word processing, I wasn't quite sure what involvement in a computer-based project would mean in terms of class time and value. And so I asked Sue Wyman, our computer technologist at Hopewell, to join me in a meeting with Jim. Jim and Sue helped me to see that a multimedia production would, in fact, enhance and enrich our study of animal habitats. Um, Jim's offer to help us with the computer project really came at a good time. We had, um, still had Apple IIe-based labs, but we were able to accumulate some Macintosh equipment through various processes. We had principals who were very supportive of technology and realized how important it was to keep some new equipment coming in through the regular budgetary process. We also had the benefit of some community projects like the um, ShopRite and the Pennington Market re register receipts, so we got some more computers through that too. What um, Jim did for us was help us to take the equipment that we'd gotten and really combine the features of it and put it together into an exciting environment for the children to work. Um, our PTO had given us a, a grant the year before and we purchased a scanner and the quick take camera that you'll see used in the project but we had only been using that on uh, a limited basis and Jim really taught us how to combine all those elements and the children had a wonderful time and really experienced the power of technology to uh, communicate what they were trying to say. I know that it's a um, project that they'll never forget. The Arctic Tundra. By Lowell Alcott, Lucy Vanessa Fishman, Andy Conley, Natasha Morris, and Chrissy Fairways. The Arctic tundra is found in parts of Canada and Asia. It is also found in Greenland and Antarctica. The Arctic tundra is the cold region around the North and South Poles. Very few plants grow in, the, in Antarctica, but some plants grow in the tundra near Antar in the Arctic. 
The Antarctic is colder than the Arctic. Even in summer, the ground just beneath the Earth is frozen in the Arctic tundra. Some animals find warmth in the water while some use other ways to keep warm. The Snowy Owl by Chrissy Fairinx. The Snowy Owl is a larger bird, round head, yellow eyes, and black tooth bill. The Snowy Owl lives in the Arctic tundra. It nests on the ground with no shelter. To catch its prey, it camouflages itself. It turns white in the winter like the snow and brown in the summer to blend in with the earth. The Snowy Owl can overpower all the animals in its surroundings. It hunts during the day. Its prey is more than 50 types of mammals and 90 types of birds. Now that Snowy Owl is on the dangerous animal list, people kill him for their beautiful feathers. The habitat of the polar bear is the Arctic tundra. They find shelter in ice and snow. In late October, the female digs a den where she will have her cubs. At birth, polar bear cubs weigh approximately one pound. The male's length can reach 11 feet, and he can weigh over a thousand pounds. Their eyesight and hearing is similar to that of a human. Their sense of smell is bitter. They can smell a seal under the ice. Although polar bears appear to be white, they have black skin and clear fur that absorbs the sun's heat and protects them from the cold. They are excellent swimmers and can be found 100 miles out of sea. Polar bear's favorite meal is seal, but they will eat anything from dead weeds, beached whales, and reindeer to seaweed. Polar bears spend most of their lives by themselves. After they have mated, the male leaves. If they meet again, he might kill the cubs. Adelie penguins live in Antarctica and therefore need special adaptations to survive. When looked at from above, the Adelie's black back is hard to see against the dark ocean floor, whereas its white underside is hard to see against the bright sky. While swimming, a penguin's small scaly feathers help to keep it dry. Under their feathers, Adelies have a thick layer of fat to keep them warm. Even in the Antarctic, penguins do get overheated. If this happens, a penguin will open its beak and hold out its flippers. One feature that distinguishes the Adelie from other penguins is the white eye ring on its black head. It has a short, stubby beak that is feathered at the bottom. When we started talking, Susan asked me, hey, can we do music underneath? Can we bring the children's artwork into the system? Can we uh, have live video? Can we do great animations? I said, wait, I said, we can do all that, but it's a more complex project. And so it's complex, but it was actually more exciting because of that. So I think Susan was the one that really, really motivated us to do as much as we did. So leading up to that day, Susan and I spent some time taking pictures from the children that they had selected on their uh, project and scanning them into the computer, getting all their animated characters ready for them. And Fran, on the other hand, had been working with the children trying to develop exactly what kind of a theme they were going to do uh, for this creative writing session. And she picked science, which turned out to be a really nice theme because the children were studying habitats around the world and she organized the children into groups of four to five and they were able to take one animal from that habitat and do research on it. And so not only were they going to be doing creative writing now, they were going to be doing some research. They were going to be doing some uh, animations which would let them get a flavor for actually producing a movie, which I think added a lot of excitement to the project for them. The Rainforest Habitat by Laura O'Neill, Maddie Pinault, Lady Hill, Sean Bielbauer, and Tim Albino. Rainforests are found in South America and Mexico, Australia, Africa, and Asia. Rainforests are only found near the equator where there's lots of sun and a lot of rain. There, the plants can grow tall. The rainforest is cloudy, humid, and hot. 
there are thousands of jungle dwelling animals. There are also hundreds of exotic plants. Chimpanzees. Chimpanzees belong to the group of animals that are called primates. Chimpanzees usually, usually weigh between 65 and 90 pounds and can grow up to be three feet tall. Chimpanzees live in the tropical rainforests of Africa. They use their strong arms to grip trees and climb branches to get away from enemies and to get food. Chimpanzees eat many different things. They have pointy canine teeth to use, they use them to open fruit and shred stems. Chimpanzees build nests high up in the trees. The leaves make the nest very comfortable and it also keeps them warm because it gets chilly in the rainforest at night. Toucans live in the rainforest of South America and Southern Mexico. Toucans use their big bill with saw-like edges to reach and cut off fruit that is high up in trees. They make their home in treetops. Toucans are sociable birds. They eat berry seeds and small fruits, and they vary their diet with insects, spiders, small lizards, and small snakes. They, pl they play catch with by throwing fruit to each other and catching it in their bills. The baboon has very sharp teeth. It has a colored face and hind parts. It also has a long tail and it has the capability to walk on two or four legs. A baboon has a dense fur coat. It has a menacing face and roar. It also can run very fast. A baboon eats some kinds of berries. It occasionally eats meat. It also eats grass stalks. A baboon uses a tree for shelter because they provide hiding spots. Baboons live with family only. They do not live with others of their kind. The skull of a macaw can go to nearly three feet. It has a tail shaped like a wedge. The macaw has a good camouflage when sitting among bright fruits and flowers. The foot of a macaw is designed for gripping branches. The two outer toes point backwards and the two inner toes point forwards. Macaws weigh about three pounds and are skinnier than most pouts but have strong legs. The macaw eats some fruits, seeds, and berries that have poison in them and not get sick. They also eat clay which helps them not get sick and has a lot of salt and minerals in it. It can crack open a Brazil nut, then eat it. They can use their beak for an extra foot. Their feet are very similar to a hand. Macaws can be found in tropical parts of Asia. They live in the hole of a tree. Macaws don't usually talk to their pallets outside their family, but they fly in small groups. The vampire bat. The vampire bat weighs 100 grams to 8. 899 grams. The wingspan of a vampire bat is 320 to 350 millimeters. There are three kinds of vampire bats. There are common vampire bats, hairy-legged vampire bats, and white-winged vampire bats. The common vampire bat skull is one inch long. Vampire bats do live in a community. When other bats get hurt, the other bats do know it, there to help it. Also, they live in, a commun in communities so they don't get cold during the winter. They keep warm by huddling together. The vampire bat lives in caves in deep, gloomy hollow trees. learning that occurred as a result of this collaboration went well beyond my expectations. The children worked together to write, revise, edit, illustrate, and produce this video. Projects that in years past 
would have been presented as oral, individual oral reports were woven together with care and team effort. The pride and, accomplish and sense of accomplishment that the children felt um, was apparent to all who attended the premiere showing in June. The enthusiasm, the enthusiasm with which the adult participants um, responded to the project was very gratifying. The Desert by Daniel Wojcik, Christina Wesley, and Chuck Cortelli, Daniel Housen, Greg Carver, and Billy Giffis. Deserts are found all over the world except Antarctica. Two deserts are found in Africa, one in Mexico and two in Australia, and two in South America and three in Soviet Union. Some deserts are rocky. Some are covered with large areas of salt or ice. Some deserts are hot and some are cold, but the thing that they all have in common is they are dry. You wouldn't think many things would live there, but you would be surprised how many things do. Here are a few of the animals, oryx, camel, lizard, tarantula, and scorpion. Some of the plants in the desert are the giant cactus and the mesquite bush. Camels spin a lot more than other animals. They have humps on their backs. They weigh about 1,200 pounds. They are seven feet high and 10 feet long. Camels live in the desert. Rainstorms do not happen much in the desert. Camels are not found in any cold places. Camels can go 17 days without drinking. Their food is plants. There can be big and small groups of camels. Scorpions have eight legs, two claws, and a tail with a stern. Scorpions' mouths are just small claws. To survive in the desert habitat, scorpions hide under rocks. They use the poison in their tails to kill their prey. The scorpion's claws are used to hold their prey before they sting. The scorpions' mouths turn the food into liquid so the scorpion can eat it. Scorpions eat a variety of foods such as spiders, scorpions, adult and baby insects, small lizards, rodents, and bats. Scorpions live in a few homes such as between rocks and in cactus. Scorpions have natural enemies like centipedes, ground beetles, mantis, spiders, bats, and lizards. One of the largest species of antelope is the oryx. The adult oryx can be 8 feet tall, including its horns, which can be 4 feet high. They can weigh as much as 450 pounds. They are usually tan, gray, or white, or a mixture of these three colors. They live in herds in dry areas in East Africa. The oryx feeds mainly upon grass and leaves, and it can go a long time without water. Their horns can be very dangerous weapons. About 300 oryx live in zoos, and about 200 have been reintroduced to the wild. One interesting fact about the oryx is that it can cool its blood in its brain by inhaling air. This lets the oryx avoid brain damage on very hot days. The horned lizard is wide and flattened. The length of them is between four and seven inches. Others are intermediate size. The horned lizard has many different ways to help it to survive in its habitat, like burying itself into the soil and squirting blood from the corner of its eye, or puffing up to scare away enemies, or flattening itself even more to scare away enemies. The horned lizard eats many different things. It eats ants, insects, arthropods, moist leaves, spiders, moss and caterpillars, and it needs very little water. The horned lizard eats in strange ways. When it needs water, it laps it up from moist leaves. It lives in the desert of Mexico and in the western United States. The horned lizard burrows under the ground when it rains. The name tarantula comes from Taranto in Italy, where they have a lot of tarantulas. Most hairs on the tarantula give people bad rashes. The tarantula has eight eyes on one bump on its head, and it is almost blind. It can only see light and dark. They have no ears. All tarantulas have two pairs of lungs. They have a black spot on their abdomen when they are young. 
They also have needle sharp fangs. When the tarantula fights, it lifts its front two feet and shows its fangs. The fangs act like straws to suck the juice out of their prey. The tarantula can stand sideways and upside down. Tarantulas can move their spinnerets very fast if one touches its abdomen. They can live long with no food. The tarantula eats beetles, grasshoppers, caterpillars, crickets, and bird spiders. This project was very significant to us, even beyond the one class of children that participated in it. Um, our district changed over to a Macintosh platform, and this summer when we wrote curriculum, we were really able to draw on everything that we learned through this project and incorporate it into our new curriculum for the new labs. So we have projects like this now going on all over the district. Just here at Hopewell School, um, Bob Alexander Science classes are finishing up a multimedia project on the environment. Heidi Olson just did a sign language animated book that the children are going to take home as gifts to their parents. And the fifth grade teachers decided to do a multimedia science fair this year instead of the traditional um, experiments and, and backboards that they usually do. So because of this project, we were really able to pull some plans together that I don't think we'd have been ready for without it. The, the Video has been used on a lot of um, training classes for teachers in the district, and it's wonderful to see how every group of teachers that watches it really comes up with some more ideas about how they can incorporate the technology into their grade level or their um, subject area. Grasslands by Danny Kaplowitz, Lauren Ackerman, Chrissy Harris, E.J. Hartig, and Peg DeHaven. Grasslands are found in every continent except for Antarctica. The smallest grassland in the world is in South America. The biggest grassland are in Africa and Asia. Grasslands are too dry to be rainforests and too wet to be deserts. Grasslands are called by many different names like plains, prairies, savannas, and pampas. Although they may have scattered bushes and trees, they are filled with one group of plants called grass. Grasslands can hold lots of herbivores, like seen on the plains of Africa. But with the grazing herd come carnivores that eat other animals, and that is why the open plain can be a very dangerous place to live. It weighs 100 to 500 pounds. The lion is 5 to 10 feet in length. In order to stay alive in the grasslands, the lion needs sharp claws, sharp teeth, and good speed. The lion's golden brown color helps the lion blend in so it can sneak up on its prey. The lion's rough tongue helps it to scrape bones and to clean itself. The baby lion cub is spotted when it is born. After a few months, it loses its spots. The lion's ears are made big so they can hear far away. The lion has a big mouth so they can call other lions far away. The lion travels with four to forty different lions. Each pride of lions has its own territory or area of land. This area may be from 10 square miles to 100 square miles. This area includes best hunting grounds, best water hole, and good hide place to hide cubs. The lion eats antelope, zebra, wildebeest, giraffe, buffaloes, and other big game that graze on the African plains. The lion kills about 15,000 wildebeest every year. Sometimes the lions have Sometimes the lions have to go for more than a day without a meal. Cheetahs. 
You can tell a cheetah from other wildcats by a line that runs from its eyes to its mouth. Cheetahs prefer to hunt gazelles, impalos, and other small antelopes. Even though they are very good hunters, they do not always catch the meals they go after. A mother cheetah is very protective of her young and very close to her young. Cheetahs and people have a long history together. People are drawn to them because they are the shyest and gentlest of all wildcats. The kangaroo is a marsupial with strong back legs, short front legs, and a long muscular tail. It can grow to be as tall as a man. Strange enough, this animal never runs, just hops, even when escaping from danger. The kangaroos roam the grasslands of Australia and New Guinea. Their diet is small leaves and grass. Kangaroos live in big groups called mobs. A mother kangaroo can have an undeveloped infant, a joey, and a yearling at the same time with the younger two living in the pouch. African elephants have rough, very rough skin. An African elephant has a round head. The elephants walk on its toes. Elephants have cushions or pads under their feet. Elephants can weigh as much as 16 men. An elephant in the zoo can eat 260 pounds of food in a day. Lions and tigers do not dare attack a full-grown elephant. Elephants bury their dead with sticks and leaves. If we expect to see elephants in the future, we, we must preserve their habitat. Zebras are black and white striped. Zebras are about four and a half feet tall. They weigh about 950 pounds. They have large ears, strong bodies, and legs. Some zebras bark. No two zebras have the same markings, so they can easily tell each other apart. Zebras live in herds in the grassland. They eat grass. During the dry season, they eat shrubs, roots, bark, and fruit. It really was exciting to see three groups of people, the children who have infinite energy anyway, just getting even more excited about this new means to do things, and the teachers who were willing to try something new and entrust us to allow all this to happen, hoping it would turn out. And for the parents to come in and actually work with their children and, and share some of these things, and it was a powerful team. I think it was really exciting, and I hope that it proves to be a good working model for, for future projects in the school system because it really does work well. So what the, this technology did in 3M's Animals and Habitats is really um, rejuvenate the study just about at a time when it would normally have come to a close. The children um, were so excited about the research, first of all, because they came into the lab and used um, new tools like the San Diego Zoo and now the children weren't just using static databases. Now, um, now they could see graphics and, and sound and hear the lions roar and look at the snakes slither. And, and one child said it was just like walking through the zoo. They were so excited about it. So the, the research aspect was very good. And the children were allowed to accumulate um, a lot of information in a short amount of time. And that's one of the real benefits of using technology in this kind of environment that it gives the, the children a chance, to, um, takes less time for the children to gather the information and really gives them more time to work with it and 
study it and analyze it and decide how they want to communicate it. And I think that's where the real learning took place. I can see that this kind of cooperative effort has great benefit to the children. And I look forward to involvement in another project like this. We teachers can really expand opportunities for our students when we open the classroom doors and look beyond the familiar strategies.